Good morning, Lakeview. Glad to have you here today. We've got beautiful weather outside. Quick, uh, quick show of hands. How many of you think this is the first service? <laughs> how many of you have already been here for two and a half hours? <laughs> and how many of you basically think it's Thursday? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of confusion in the first service, but, uh, but people made it, and that's what matters. We're glad to have you here. Welcome to Eastern Standard Time here at Lakeview. Uh, the service is no different, but we are kicking off a new series to help memorialize it. Um, it's also a pretty special day. Uh, the bronze side of Team Woltman, Dale Woltman, it's his birthday today. Wish him a happy birthday for him, will you? There he is in the back. He's awesome. He's awesome. Uh, so we're happy to have him uh, with us again for another year. Dale's 104, but he uses sunscreen, so he looks great. He looks great. My name is Sam. I'm one of the elders here at Lakeview, and uh, we're so happy that you're joining us this morning. Uh, if you're worshiping with us online, thank you for making Lakeview part of your Sunday. If you're with us for the very, very first time, we actually have a gift for you. All you need to do is stop by our Connect tent outside and say, hey, I'm new, and you'll get some cool Lakeview swag. They may ask you for a phone number, they may ask you for an email. Don't fake those, go ahead and give them your real information. That's just so we can reach out to you during the week and ask how we can pray for you, pray with you. And uh, the email is so that you can get some of our announcements. We've got a lot going on. Um, I just wanna thank you personally because last week we ended our series on stewardship. And did you know that following that series, 75 people signed up for ministry opportunities. That's amazing, so thank you. Thank you, every one of you. Staying on the theme of numbers, you know, uh, just over a year ago, our women's ministry uh, kicked off and they had their initial uh, women's ministry event. I, it, it surprised us, they had like 84 women then and the men's ministry were like, oh, we gotta, we gotta catch up. Well, this past weekend they had another event and over 125 women showed up. So special thanks to you guys. Uh, women's ministry is doing great. Meredith Cadwallader, uh, who heads up our women's ministry was here during the first service, sound asleep because she's still tired from the event. Uh, so thank you for all of you that helped with that. Uh, it was great. We had a lot of ladies visit uh, that weren't from Lakeview and they really appreciated it. Speaking of women's ministry, we do have Lydia's Table coming up this coming Saturday at 8.30, a great uh, opportunity to get together with other ladies and pray for about an hour in our Family Life Center. Make sure you come to that if you'd like. Uh, it's that time of year again. We've got Operation Christmas Child in the house. You probably noticed the green and red boxes in the, um, in the hallway. It's a chance to uh, pick up one of those boxes, fill them up with a gift. We send them around the world and let others know that we love them, someone loves them. In fact, you know what? Take a look at this quick video. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want every child to know that there's a God. I want every child to know that God loves them, that God sent his son from heaven to this earth to take our sins. We've got a charge to go into the world, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, here I am. Take me and send me and use me. God laid it on my heart. The Himbas need someone to give them the word of God. My vision for the Salama Khan tribe is that we will share the gospel and to establish a house church here so that they also can receive the, the, the blessing of Christ. Through the gift boxes, we are going places that no church will be allowed. Places like Gamvi, that floating village. We are reaching those that have never heard the gospel. We find them having not even a Bible in their own language. Areas of the world where people need to know that God loves them and cares them and sent his son from heaven to this earth for them. God loves you and God loves me. Operation Christmas Child opened doors to evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. When a child receives a shoebox, it shows them who God really is and how much he cares for them. We bring 
give to the children, also the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The churches are using these shoe boxes, the greatest journey discipleship program, to reach out to the ends of the earth with the gospel. God sent his son to this earth on a rescue mission. Jesus Christ died and shed his blood on the cross for our sin. And then on the third day, God in heaven said it's enough and he raised his son to life. This is the good news and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. We love Operation Christmas Child, and if you were with us during our missions uh, uh, Sunday, I don't know if you remember or not, but we actually had a special guest here who received one of these boxes, and it changed his life. So please participate with us. Uh, again, the boxes are right out on this side in the lobby. Grab those. Uh, we're, we're looking to actually have some of those returned by next week, so make sure you grab them this week. On this side of our lobby, up on this wall, is our prayer box. So if you've got a prayer request or a praise, there's a card underneath the chair in front of you. Go ahead and fill that out with what that prayer, uh, prayer request or praise may be. Uh, put your contact information on there if you'd like someone to call and pray with you. Don't put your contact information on there if you'd just like someone to pray for you anonymously. Either way, use those cards, fold them up, drop them off in that box that's mounted on the wall. We have a very qualified, very trained prayer team that will pray along with you or for you this week. In fact, if you've got an immediate prayer need, we'll have those prayer partners on either side of the platform this morning following service. Don't, don't miss this opportunity. We take prayer serious. We'd love to come alongside of you. Thank you for your continued giving. You can do so here. We have collection boxes in the back. You can uh, participate with, in giving online, mylakeviewchurch.com. We hope that, uh, I want to thank you coming out of our stewardship series. You've always done an amazing job uh, financially from a stewardship perspective. As you consider your year-end giving, of course, we'd like Lakeview to be part of that consideration. But thank you, thank you, thank you. We hope that you see that we're using your gifts responsibly. God is continuing to bless Lakeview. It's wonderful. Okay, I am pretty sure that someone over here doesn't know someone from over there. So why don't we take a second, get up to say hi to someone and, and, and shake someone's hand you've never met before. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, Lakeview. It is good to see everybody in the house of the Lord as we get ready to sing a little bit. I got a question for you guys. Who wants a little joy this morning? Who wants a little joy this morning? Come on, come on, come on, come on. The rest of you guys are still trying to figure out what day it is probably with the time change. But uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll let it slide this week. You know what the cool thing is? When we receive joy... Um, when we choose joy, we receive peace. We receive peace from God. And it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to receive joy. You know, when we get cut off in traffic, I see faces like, mm-hmm, guilty. Yeah. Um, to receive joy, you know, whatever season we're in. Um, and I just want you guys to think about that as we go through this next month or so about the word joy and how joy can affect our lives when we choose joy. So y'all ready to sing this morning? I know Robert's ready to sing. Let's go.
worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on. Sound awesome. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes some way. As he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave, my God still rolling stones away. That's what happens when you choose joy, man. Let's continue in worship. Right. 
stands for me and stands in my defense. And Jesus is your blood. He's the name above all names. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Thank you. 
just take a moment. Let's just breathe that in. Holy Spirit. I love that line. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. Isn't that right? Above all, above all we long for you, God. We search for you. We know you're here. Your presence is near. You are near us. Even though we think sometimes you're far away, you are right next to us. You are with us through all. So Holy Spirit, just be here. Just be with us this morning. Mm. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning and welcome, welcome to Lakeview Church. So glad you're here this morning. My name is Tim. I'm the lead pastor here. You picked a great Sunday to be here. If this is your first time or you're new-ish, you haven't filled out a Connect card, as Sam said, please fill out one of those Connect cards. I'd love to shoot you a text this week so I can be praying with you and for you. I just need to take a, a little bit of a poll. I've noticed, I've noticed this trend in recent years. And maybe you've noticed it as well. It's almost like the Christmas season starts like a little bit earlier every year. Like it used to be when I was growing up, we would, we would celebrate Thanksgiving and then we would start the Christmas season. But now it's like we, we've skipped over Thanksgiving, Halloween's not even an afterthought. And then you'll walk into Hobby Lobby on like July 5th and the Christmas trees are up. So I, I need to know where you're at as a people. How many of you would say, no, we have to get through Thanksgiving. Christmas decorations don't go up until after Thanksgiving. That's you. Wait. Okay. How many of you are like my wife who would say, goodbye, Halloween. Hello, Christmas. Let's go. Okay. I see you. How many of you, your tree is already up right now. Just my house. Okay. That's what I thought. So I figured this, if we, can, if we can decorate our houses earlier and earlier every year, why can't we start our Christmas series just a touch early this year? So welcome to Lakeview Church. Merry Christmas. We're jumping into our Christmas series. Let's go. If you've been here with us for a while, you know this about us. We love going through books of the Bible. We love going verse by verse and just gleaning everything we can from God's Word. Today, we're kicking off a brand new series. I'm so excited about this. It's a short book. We're going to spend the rest of the year in here. We're going to go verse by verse through the book of Philippians. It's an incredible little book. We're calling it Joy to the World, not because there's joy in the world. Many of you already know that. We're calling it Joy to the World, not because the world brings joy. Many of you have realized that. We're calling it Joy to the World because we have the joy to bring to the world, and his name is Jesus. The book of Philippians is God's guide to joy. It's his guide to joy. We're going to see how joy and Jesus ultimately go together. Before we jump into Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, let me give you a little bit of the background here. This, this little church at Philippi. Um, if you want to do a deeper dive, you should go to Acts chapter 16. It actually tells you how this church got planted. It's kind of an origin story for this, this church in Philippi. It was planted by a guy named Paul. Maybe you've heard of him. Typically, Paul would walk into town. He would preach first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. He would preach to the Jews at uh, their synagogues. He would, he would show up. He would go to the synagogue. They'd have some sort of Bible study. He would help lead the Bible study. He would then point them to Jesus. Then he would go find us Gentiles, typically in a marketplace type setting, and he would preach Jesus to them there. 
Now, this is what's really interesting here. Paul shows up in Philippi, which is a Roman colony, and know the historical context. They're very proud of this designation. They weren't always a Roman colony, but they are at this time period. This little Roman colony, and Paul goes to preach and teach at a synagogue, but he can't because there aren't any. There are no synagogues in Philippi. Here's why this is significant. It only took 10 believing men to form a synagogue. So you can do the math. That means in this entire town, there were not 10 believing men to form a synagogue. So here's what Paul does. Instead, he ends up finding a prayer meeting. It's a pretty cool story. There's a group of women hosting a prayer meeting. Paul shows up to this prayer meeting with a group of women. Now, this kind of sounds like our culture today. Statistically speaking, women tend to be more spiritual. For whatever reason, it tends to be women who go to church more than men, women who give more than men, women who serve more than men. So, hey, Lakeview men, consider this your wake-up call. Lakeview women, great work. Let's keep it up. So the church in Philippi was originally founded by some women with Paul. They were literally at a prayer meeting. They became converted. Among these women was this lady named Lydia. Hey, you've heard of her, possibly. Lydia's table. She deals in fabrics and garments. In fact, she actually dealt with the color of royalty, which was purple. So we know that Lydia was an affluent businesswoman. She was very successful. She would have been the one designing the designer's clothes. She would have been the one who's got, you know, the Yeezys and the Gucci's and like you name like whatever that brand is, that's where she's at. So she, I don't know if you've ever been in that world, that's the world that this woman lives in. So she, she helps plant this church with Paul and she actually becomes one of the main supporters of Paul's ministry, financially speaking. How cool is that? Pretty cool story. Well, some more women end up getting saved. Among them, there's this young girl who has a demonic spirit, needs to be cast out. We could also make an argument that the Philippian jailer from Acts 16, he would have been probably on the launch team for this Philippian church. And all of a sudden, God has started his work in Philippi. And I mention these characters because it's like the most unlikely group of people that God brought together to plant this church. You've got... An affluent businesswoman, a demon-possessed girl, and a Philippian jailer who've come into a loving relationship with Jesus, and suddenly, get this, the first church in Europe is formed. The very first church in Europe. Think of the legacy of Christianity in and through Europe. All of the missionaries sent around the world, all of that started with the first fruits and planting of the first church in Europe, this church at Philippi. Now, about 10 years has passed, so by the time Paul's letter is given to the Philippians, there's been about 10 years of ministry. They've been through a lot. There was a lot of persecution for this little church. Paul is most likely in prison while writing this letter, and yet the key theme of the book is joy. It's just wild to me. He wasn't somewhere comfortable. He wasn't living his best life now. He was literally in a jail cell writing about joy to a congregation that he dearly loves. And here's what I love about the church at Philippi. We're going to see this as we go through this text. They, they weren't a train wreck. Imagine that. Like The, the church itself, it, it wasn't a train wreck. And I get that, that there's no such thing as a perfect church, but I think we can make an argument that there is such thing as a healthy church. We can make that argument because we see one right here. We see a, a healthy church, and I hate to say this, but there's probably some people here today because they've come from unhealthy situations, and I get that church hurt is very real. I've experienced it. If you are going through a church hurt right now, please know that I love you. I'm praying with you and for you. If you're here and you're like, look, I'm, I'm not ready to jump in. I'm not ready to serve. I'm not ready to join a home group or a small group. I just need some time to heal. Let me encourage you just to do that. I've told our, our staff and our elders over the last few years, we've seen this trend where we've become a little bit of a hospital 
for hurting staff members of other churches, hurting pastors of other churches. And by all means, if you're here for a few weeks, that's great. If you're here for a few months, that's awesome. If you're here for the rest of your life, so be it. I hope you'll see Lakeview Church, if that's you here, as a place where you can sit and be still and spend some time healing. The church in Philippi is a a great example of a church that genuinely loves each other. There's this sense of authenticity with the church in Philippi. It's, It's one that I hope we, as a body of believers, can also portray to the outside world. We'll see that they love each other, they care for each other, they pray for one another, they eat meals together, they laugh together. Yeah, it's okay to laugh, like even in church, it's okay. They're not perfect. Paul does um, talk about their need for unity. Apparently there was a disagreement among some of the women in the church, so he does talk about the need for unity. But what we see here is a great framework for a healthy body of believers. Other pastors often ask me how I've survived being at the same church for 14 years because the lifespan of a pastor is much shorter at a particular church. And I always tell them it's because the people God brings to this church. Are we a perfect church? No, there's no such thing as a perfect church. But I I do believe we seek to be an authentic body of believers that care deeply about the gospel and care about each other. Even in recent weeks, I've seen the way you've lovingly wrapped your arms around hurting families in this church. You've, You've put aside whatever you're going through in your life, and you've realized that there are others that need your presence and your love and your care and your prayers, and you've done just that, Lakeview. It's also interesting to me that Paul never really offers any harsh rebukes to this particular congregation. There are plenty of examples in the New Testament of churches that are in need of rebuke, churches that are in need of correcting. There's a church in Corinth that basically thought partying and and debauchery was like the key to growing in Christ. They were way off. It's pretty crazy. There's a church in Galatia who thought they had to have this Jesus plus the law mentality in order to get to heaven. So what does Paul do? He writes this really strongly worded letter to these churches. Hi, guys, there's some issues here. We need to fix these things. But the tone here is very different. The tone of Paul's letter to the Philippians is not only pastoral, it's also fatherly. It's loving, it's caring, it's sincere, it's authentic. Now, this isn't a particularly long book of the Bible. It's only four chapters, 104 verses. Seriously, it'll take you maybe 15 minutes to read this book. All of 15 minutes. So yeah, you could probably find joy in 15 minutes or less. You could switch your car insurance to Geico and maybe save some money or... (laughs) In the same amount of time, you could read the book of Philippians and probably find joy. And I would argue this tiny book is still incredibly relevant and applicable in our lives today. So I want to encourage you. Here's kind of our our congregational challenge as we go through this series. I want us as a congregation to read through the book of Philippians every single week. Every single week as we go through this series. What you'll see it as you read is you'll find, this is great, you're going to find like this is like the greatest hits of Christian memory verses. You're like, I memorized all those as a kid. Yeah, they were all in Philippians. Right? It's rejoice in the Lord always. It's got, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is jam-packed with these amazing verses to memorize. This letter should encourage us to live for Christ courageously. And one of the overwhelming themes is this idea of joy, having joy. It's not fake happiness. This isn't a, oh, hey, how are you doing today? I'm blessed. No, you're not. You had a terrible week. Paul reminds us that Ultimate joy doesn't come from comfortable circumstances. Ultimate joy comes from a living, vibrant communion with Christ. Paul doesn't say, look at my house, now rejoice. He doesn't say, look at my wife or my kids or my bank account, and now let's rejoice. No, Paul says, look at Jesus just like I'm doing and rejoice with me. Paul's going to speak of 
joy or rejoicing roughly 19 times in this little book. Oftentimes, people think Christianity and joy don't go together, but they absolutely do. Our God is a joyful God. Heaven is a joyful place. Nobody gets to heaven and they're like, oh, this is where I ended up. Like nobody's bummed to be in the presence of God. 2,700 times your Bible uses words like joy, rejoicing, gladness, feasting, celebrating, happiness. It uses all these words together because they all mean the same thing. Our God is awesome, and our God makes life awesome even when life isn't awesome. How many of you are walking through some things right now that are terrible? Guess what? God can still provide joy in the midst of pain and heartache, and we have living examples in this room right now. We serve an awesome God, and he provides joy when the outside world doesn't see it. It's a joy that literally doesn't make sense to other people. Joy can, can bring you to the Lord because if you are looking for joy, you will not find it unless you find Jesus. You're not going to find joy anywhere in anything else other than Jesus Christ. 104 verses in Philippians, 19 times he talks about joy, 61 times he names Jesus. 61 times. Joy and Jesus go together. You cannot have true, enduring, deep, godly joy without Jesus Christ. That is the big idea here. And I oftentimes wonder how people are able to walk through this life at all without Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're looking for hope, you're looking for joy, you're looking for fulfillment, you're looking for satisfaction, I've got great news for you. It can be found. It has a name. His name is Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to see this incredible theme of joy that threads this book together. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to dive right in. We'll see if we can get through the first 11 verses. I make no guarantees. Philippians 1, starting in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So we have our author here, our co-authors, Paul and Timothy. These guys have been through a lot together. They do life together. They do ministry together. They serve together. I love this picture of community we have right here in the opening verse. You're not meant to go through this alone. Ministry was never meant to be a Lone Ranger style of ministry. It's why I firmly believe in the New Testament model of a plurality of leaders in the church. It's why I'm one among equals on the elder board. We do life and ministry together. They call themselves servants. That Greek word there could also be translated as slaves. They call themselves slaves of Christ Jesus. If you've ever studied letters from this time period, then you'll know that the opening or the greeting or the introduction is very important. Typically, you'll be given the author and you'll be given some credentials on that author as to why they should be writing this letter to this particular group of people. So of all the credentials they could have chosen, right? Remember, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. We might see that, that title in other parts, but not here in Philippians. Here in Philippians, they, I mean, just think about this. Of all the credentials they could have chosen to open this letter with, they thought, this is the one that's going to make the most sense for this letter to these faithful believers. Servants or slaves. We're going to see this theme of submission and sacrificial service throughout this letter. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So who's this letter to? It's to all the saints. That word might seem foreign to you. That word might feel a little bit weird to you. It's possible because our definition of the word saint is not a biblical definition of the word saint. Maybe you grew up in the Catholic tradition. So when you heard the word saint, you automatically thought of some sort of like superhero in the faith. And, and these superheroes all have like these superhero powers and I've got to like go or I've got to pray to certain superheroes or I've got to wear certain things or bury certain things to like get these powers. Maybe you wore your St. Christopher medallion so that when you died, you could bypass purgatory and get right into heaven. You're like, wow, that's like a fast pass at Disney World. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Pretty cool. <laughs> like you get to skip the line. Everyone else is going to smolder for a little bit. 
There's also the patron saint of real estate. I think that one is um, St. Joseph. You're supposed to, legend has it, you're supposed to bury St. Joseph upside down in your front yard so your home can sell above market value. So real estate agents, there you go. In all seriousness, the first saints were actually martyrs who died for their love of Jesus. They were remembered kind of like veterans with a memorial wall. It was a really sweet thing. But then over time, tradition sets in, man-made religion sets in, man-made rituals set in. Now there's like this 10-step this process to becoming a saint in the Catholic Church. Is that biblical? No. Like we, we won't find that in the Bible at all. That, that's man-made religion. That's man-made ritual. The Bible says there's actually one step to becoming a saint. If you belong to Jesus, you get to be a saint. You're like, that doesn't make sense. That's crazy. It doesn't make sense. That's called grace. You're like, I don't deserve that. You absolutely don't deserve that. That's the grace being lavished out on you. Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus, that's to all the believers, to all those who love Jesus at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. So we're going to see that word overseer in other places in the New Testament. That's like our board of elders. So overseers can also be translated as elders or pastors or overseers. You'll see a list of qualifications for elders, overseers, or pastors in Titus and Timothy. Overseers were shepherds of the flock. They, they, they were They were to know, to feed, to lead, and they did this through word and prayer. And we actually see a distinction between elders and deacons here. I I grew up in a church that was led by deacons, and then the more I studied my New Testament, the more I realized that that's actually not how the early church functioned at all. Deacons are those who not only serve, but help serve others as well. So we have two very distinct offices in the church of elder or overseer and deacon. Paul says in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us, hey, there's this fountain of grace and peace, and it doesn't come from within. It doesn't come from something this world has to offer. This fountain of grace and peace comes from God our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Can you feel the warmth of this letter? Anybody ever received a thank you card? I got one in the mail a couple days ago. It was just such a sweet little reminder, right? Of the heartfelt love and thanks and gratitude. that's, That's Paul's pastoral and fatherly heart here. He's just thankful for these people. Verse 4. Paul says, Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership, verse 5, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I love Paul's tone toward his people. If your people are tender, your words can be tender. There's certain books where the people are pretty tough and Paul's words are tough, but here the people are tender and he's telling them, listen to this, I thank God for you. I remember you. I'm praying for you. You give me joy. You've been partnering with me in the gospel faithfully for over a decade. Love for his people, joy for his people, gratitude for his people. So let me ask you this. Do we, on a regular basis, thank God for the people he has placed in our lives? Do we thank God for the people he's placed in our lives? One one commentator on Philippians said it like this. I love this. He said, Paul rarely thanked God for the stuff in his life. Paul thanked God for people who, despite Whatever trouble they might have been to him remained a source of joy and thanksgiving. So let me ask you again, do you, on a regular basis, thank God for the people he has placed in your life? Maybe you're thinking, yeah, but like the people in my life, they let me down a lot, like on a regular basis. Well, I would argue that Paul even wrote a word of thanksgiving for the crazy Corinthians. That's impressive. It's instructive, it's hopeful, but if you're a a super critical person, 
If you are always focusing on what's wrong, it is going to be very difficult for you to be a grateful person. Don't look for perfection before you show gratitude. Look for evidences of grace in people's lives. Let me encourage you to be quick to thank God for Christian virtues in others. Remember, sanctification is oftentimes a slow process. It's possible that someone might even be thanking God for you today. I see some spouses in the room with looks of shock and amazement. <laughs> Don't allow a few stumbles and struggles to rob you of joy and gratitude. Take a view of the big picture and learn to give God thanks. Recognize that Jesus has already taken care of your greatest problem through his cross and resurrection. Realize that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. As you reflect on where God has brought you in his loving faithfulness and how he has reached down and rescued you, does it cause you to give thanks? Does it fill your heart with great joy? Just think about the people who have impacted you in the community of faith that surrounds you. Does it cause you to give joyful thanks? It's easy to see the negative in people. It's easy to point out the negative. It's easy to find problems. It's easy to air those problems with anyone who will listen. But I want us to remember here that this was the this is the attitude of the greatest missionary in history. And by the way, he's sitting in a jail cell while writing about joy, thanksgiving, and gratitude. This attitude of joyful thanks in the midst of dire circumstances. This can be tough for us. Because we often think that we need more stuff in order to be happy. Like, how could we possibly experience joy in America if we don't have more, if we don't have bigger Right? We often think, yeah, bigger is the answer. We need a bigger house, I need bigger muscles, so I need a bigger church. But what if what we really need is a bigger vision of God? Nothing else is an ultimate source of joy. You can have all of those things and never know this joy. If you have everything but Jesus, you will always be longing for more. I don't care how massive that bonus check is, it will never be enough to satisfy you. If you have nothing but Jesus, you have everything you need for joy. That's literally Paul here. I mean, just look at the decadence and the excess of the modern culture that we live in. None of it provides what people ultimately desire. We're seeking hope and fulfillment. We're longing for meaning. We're looking for that joy. And Paul writes this letter and he's like, it's here. I've got it. I hope you'll find it. It's Jesus. Then he gives us, he gives us verse six, which for many of you might even be your life verse. It's this up, uh, this one hundred percent money back guarantee. Look at verse six. Paul says, "And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ." I love this promise that God is going to finish what He started. I know for us, we have great ideas, and we can start on that project, and then it sits there, and it goes, on, it goes forgotten until we get elbowed by someone we love to finish said project. God always finishes what he starts. And this, this, is, this is really the Christian life. The Christian life is what God does for you. It's what God does in you, and it's what God does through you. Did you know that the word gospel appears more times in Philippians per verse than any other book of the Bible? It's a short book. This word gospel means good news. It means good news. Part of the reason that we can rejoice is that we have Jesus 
who brings us to the world, and, and he is the good news. Jesus is that good news. Excuse me. The good news is this. The good news is that Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus has risen, and Jesus has done a work for me, in me, and through me. That's what he says right here. He began a good work in you. Who is that good work? That's Jesus. That good work in you is Jesus. Jesus is the someone who lives in you. This is amazing because what he starts, he's going to finish. Some of you are like, yeah, but I... I've gotten off track. I've been faithless. I've got great news. We serve a God who is faithful. Our faith is in a faithful God. And when he starts something, he's going to finish it. He has started to love you. He started to bless you. He started to change you. And he's not going to stop. I get it. We're We're not perfect. We all have faults. We all have failures. We all have flaws. But look at what God has done in your life. I mean, I've heard the testimony of many of you. I've heard what God has done in and through you. It's one of the reasons I love just just grabbing breakfast with with members of this congregation. I I just love hearing your story. I met with a couple this week, and they just poured out their hearts, and I heard all these incredible things that God's done in them and through them and for them. And they're like, well, what questions do you have for me? And I said, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to hear your story. God always finishes what he starts. Look at verse 7. Paul says, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, verse 8, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. I hope you see this authenticity here because this is the emotional side of the Apostle Paul. This is the real human side of Paul. He has a genuine relationship with these people. This isn't just surface level. This is a deep relationship with them. It would have been very easy for the Philippians to write Paul off, to turn their backs on him, just like it is today when someone was sent to jail or to prison. It was disgraceful. Typically, the family would disown them. They would want nothing to do with that person. So yeah, it would be easy for a church to say, oh, our our pastor, our missionary, we want nothing to do with him, but that's not what they did. They didn't just love and care and pray. They supported him, literally supported him. It's why he actually wrote this letter. We'll get to that in in a couple of weeks. But he's actually thanking them directly for this support they have shown him. Verse 9, this this whole opening is really just this sweet, sweet prayer that Paul has for his people that he cares about. Verse 9, he said, And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. I want you to grow in your love for Christ. Parents, is this not our prayer for our kids? That they would grow in their knowledge and love for Jesus. Pastors, is this not our prayer for our congregations? That they would grow in their knowledge and love for Jesus. This is Paul's heart. Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul's burning passion for his people is that they would continue to grow in their relationship with Jesus, that they would become more and more like Christ. And that's why we preach the gospel every single week here at Lakeview Church, week in and week out, because this is our desire for you, that you would grow in your faith, that you would grow in your love and in your knowledge of Jesus. Why? It's not so that we can we can just keep reproducing good moral citizens. The why is actually given to us here at the end of verse 11. Paul says, to the glory and praise of God. That's why. That's why. This is all for the glory and praise of God. That's why it's on the back of our Lakeview t-shirts, right? The glory of God in all things. Is anybody else just a little bit excited to dive into this incredible book 
especially during what I would consider to be the best time of the year. Our text this morning, Paul emphasizes joy, gospel partnerships, assurance, affection. Think about this. Even though his skin is probably chafed from being chained to a Roman guard, his heart is still filled with thanksgiving and joy and gratitude. So is it possible to have thanksgiving and joy and gratitude even in really tough situations? Yeah, it is. Is it going to make sense to the rest of the world? Nope. It's just not. But it is possible. But there are some things that are going to rob you of this joy. If you are Christless, you won't find joy. If you are prayerless and ungrateful, you're going to have a really hard time finding joy. If you don't have gospel partnerships where you're in a loving, grace-filled community with other believers, it's going to be really difficult for you to find joy. If you don't have the assurance of salvation that what God started in you, he's going to complete, it's going to be hard for you to find joy. If you don't have affectionate relationships, it's going to be tough to find joy. So let us us look to Jesus who went to the cross for us, who bore our sin and punishment so that we might be reconciled to God and enjoy him forever. I'm praying that as we go through this book each and every week, we will leave here encouraged and filled with joy, with thanksgiving, with gratitude. And I'm not saying we just overlook our circumstances and we just don't even think about the situation that we're in. No, we have these things in the middle of the heartache, in the middle of the pain. I love the first Sunday of the month here at Lakeview Church because first Sunday is Communion Sunday. It's the Lord's Supper. If you came in this morning and you did not receive the elements, you could just slip up your hand now. We have a few who would love to get those to you. We've got a couple here in this section. The Lord's Supper is a, it's really a celebration of our continual identification with Christ and his church. It's why we don't just do this one time. It's something we do over and over and over. I heard one pastor describe communion like this, and I'll never forget it. He said, Communion is like renewing our vows with God. I love that picture, this vowel renewal process. The Lord's Supper is also the only act of worship in the New Testament that we've been given specific instructions for as a church. It's called communion in 1 Corinthians 10. It's also called the Lord's table or the breaking of bread in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 20. In Luke 22, we see Jesus celebrating this meal with his disciples before he went to the cross. We see in Acts this meal is practiced repeatedly by the early church. And really what communion is, is it's a time for reflection. It's a time for repentance. It's a time for renewal. And yes, it's a time for rejoicing. So here's what I want us to do before we, before we partake in communion together as a church family. I want us to spend just a few moments in prayer together. If you, wanna, if you wanna pray with someone or for someone as a family unit or with some friends nearby, or, or you just wanna pray by yourself, that's great. But I want us to enter into a time of prayer now, and I want you to specifically use this time for reflection, for repentance, for renewal, and yes, for rejoicing. Maybe there are some people God has placed in your life that you just need to say thank you, God, for. Will you go to the Lord in prayer now?
Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we serve you. We thank you for this incredible reminder this morning of this joy that you fill us with. This joy in spite of what we're walking through or going through. This joy in the midst of the pain and the sorrow and the heartache and the confusion. Holy Spirit, will you fill us with this un unspeakable joy? I thank you for Paul's pastoral and fatherly tone here, this reminder for us to thank you, God, for the people you've placed in our life. So God, we thank you. Thank you for our friends, our family members. We, we thank you for even the difficult people you've placed in our lives, God. God, we are so thankful that what you start, you finish. So will you continue to work on our hearts? Will you continue to mold and shape and change us? God, we do not want to leave here the same way that we came in. Will you help us to fall more in love with you? God, I pray for peace and for comfort. God, as we as a church family do walk through tragedy, God, will you provide peace and comfort? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul? For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you take of the loaf? In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you take of the cup? Will you pray with me? Jesus, your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus, it is only through you, that we find true and everlasting joy. You are the only path to eternal life. So if there's anyone here, God, that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, it's my prayer that right now, God, you would reveal to them that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing in and through us, and we thank you for continuing to work in and through us. We love you, we praise you, and it is all for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here this morning and you're in need of prayer, you want to pray for someone, you want to pray with someone, we're going to have prayer partners who are going to make themselves available right now. They'll be here up at the front. They'd love to pray with you and for you. And also on behalf of the Polis family, we have a memorial service for baby Nathaniel over at Live Oaks Bible Church at 2 p.m. You are all invited to that as well. Will you now go in the grace and peace that can only come from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Will you go in grace and peace? Amen.